This episode of Lost Anarchy Presents has been brought to you by Ziggurat.com. There's nothing fake about it. No, I got in this morning. What's that? I'm making the free orders. They're fixing the those, those got to be live. We are live, finally. We are live. Okay, and I'm going to be moving. Okay. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, when you're a child, were you, like, into music then? Oh, and did you want to score then? Or were you thinking, like, to be in a band? When I'm saying score, like, not go, you know, nail score, but, like, do you want to make, like, score for film? No, or, not as a child. Now, that did come later, but I adore music as, as a young kid. In fact, when I was, like, six years old, living in France at the time. Oh, cool. And I would come home after school, and what I love to do was to get up on my dining room table and put on Beethoven's Fifth and or Ninth Symphony and air conduct it, standing on the table from beginning to end. And that was one of my passions for about a year, doing that. And, and so it was mostly, when I was in the early age, mostly classical, but, but when the Beatles came in and prior to that, I was definitely into that music as well. And then one day when I was 11 years old, uh, we were shooting a film in Spain. My father was a producer, director, and writer as well. Uh, and uh, the first night in Madrid, we went to go see a flamenco show. I was 11 at the time. And so we go to this flamenco show, and I felt a pedal with the instrument of guitar uh, playing. The next day I went out and bought myself a guitar, and within a year I taught myself how to play and put my own dance together, and the year after that I was touring around Italy. And then a the year after that, for about five years, I touring, touring around Europe with my own dance. So I did the classical, I did the, uh, the, the rock and roll sort of thing. And then I came back to this country in 1971, and I studied formally for a few years. And it was at that point that I went back to Europe, sort of to gather my thoughts, because I was doing some production work, and uh, that I had, had, you know, musical education. And I decided, you know, I loved movies. I grew up with movies. And I love music. What, what do I want to do with my life? Right? And the light bulb went off, sitting on a beach in Monte Carlo. <laughs> and it's true. Music for films. Ooh, what did I do? And I came back here, and within a few months, got my first job scoring on a great film called Laser Blast. And I co-scored it with Joel Goldsmith, who was, who was a close friend of mine for many years, son of Jerry Goldsmith. And that's how it all started. So no, it, it wasn't just something that I knew I wanted to do from an early age. It just kind of so it's something you pursue because some composers they kind of fall into it on accident they're pursuing kind of a different avenue and then some of them that was their goal to do so you once you figured out you wanted to be a composer you went for it or it wasn't like an accident well I would say it well no it was something that was intentional I really wanted to do something like it was kind of an epiphany of, of, of sorts we call that fate brother or, or fate <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, it was a lot of ingredients coming together at the right time and after having done the first you know it, it went pretty well it was pretty well received you know it had a huge budget of a thousand dollars Oh wow! <laughs> right, and that was a lot for 1971, right? You know, well, now we're talking 1977 or something. <laughs> yeah, a few years that, so That's before it, my it, time, but yeah, but by a year, it's still not a whole lot of money two, to do yeah, a whole score. But anyway, we 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 did, we did it, and within a year, I got my second score. Except this one was recording it in London with the London Symphony. So it went from a no budget thousand dollar thing to you know, something like forty or fifty thousand dollars budget with a real orchestra. And that one met with a lot of success and was the was the first digital score ever put out along with Star Trek one, exact same time, one day apart. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> That's how it all started. 
what's your whole approach when you're doing a score? Like, are you taking more input from like the directors, or are you given some free range of what it is? Like, you watch the movie and you come up with your own ideas, or are you like collaborating with like the director, or the writer, or producer? Well, every circumstance is a little different. It really depends on who holds the power. Some films the director is God, other films the producer is God, some TV shows your nine executive producers on it all think they're God, right? So it's a matter of... Yeah, I've worked you know, on a lot of sets, but on the background level, so each set... Yeah, so it's, it's, you have to be very diplomatic in you know, how you deal with things. But, um, the, the technique itself of um, dealing with people, it, you, want to, you want to give them what they want, but you're also, you're not there as a, you know, as a person, as a 3D printer, right? You want to give your, your input as a creator, right? So you, tr you, you want to do that, but you want to do it in the, in the, within the confines of what the movie is. So if you're being a legion to the movie, you're going to stay on track. You'll, you'll be okay. Um, we do sometimes get into battles between what a producer wants, what a director wants, and you have to be very careful and sort of find a way to say that they're both on 100% right. <laughs> sometimes you got to do that and find a way to convince them that the way that you've come up with is the right way. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Or not, it, it, it works. I mean, you, you obviously you want to do your job and what's best for the film. That's ultimately your responsibility. And uh, so you can only do that. Yeah, there's movies with amazing scores, but the writing, the acting's kind of cheesy, but the music lays the emotion so well that people don't realize Oh, it's really rather a bad movie. Because the music is doing that subliminal, it's approaching you from a subliminal it's right level, and it's, it's important, if it's done well, to get those ingredients out. And I've had plenty of good opportunities to do really nice music for really bad times. Something we've all, everybody in this room has had a lot of experience at. Um, is horror your favorite genre to do scores from, or do you like action movies or like drama more? Like everyone here today is horror. No, my, my favorite is, is uh, I'll call it uh, films with emotion. Um, doesn't matter to me if they're you know, fantasy type films or if they're period piece films or, or even if they're horror films. I like, I like emotion. Um, so I would say dramatic films I love because you get a lot of things, a lot of those ingredients. Um, fantasy films can have a lot of emotion. A lot of emotion. It depends. As long as it has lots of, I, I like to pull on, I like to pull on hard strings and you know things that are real to all of us as humans. I, that's that's what I really like. And you don't get a whole lot of opportunity in horror, right? You like to pull on other things, like it's pull your head off. It's more like suspense building. Yeah. Horror is my favorite genre of movie, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I love it. I've done a ton of other things. Mm -hmm. You know, I do love it. So it's, um, I like emotion. And you can have emotion in horror. Right? No question about it. Horror is kind of only emotion. Like it's a certain emotion, which is fear, but it's still an emotion. Yeah. No, that's true. That emotion. That emotion. Right. But I like emotion like of the, of the heart, sort of the... You know what I mean. You get emotional when you hear the Game of Thrones sound. You, you do. And I, I just want a couple of characters to come back and they're not... I get emotional about a couple of characters. Oh yeah, you're, you're current on this season, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. And, yeah. Jon Snow is coming back. Uh, so I He's totally coming back. I, 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 I would tend to agree with you on that. <laughs> like, no way around it. He is coming back. 
So, anything else you would like to know? <laughs> I know in here they list you as reanimator. That came out how long ago? That was early 80s, correct? Basically, I think it's having its 32nd anniversary. Does it get old that that of all your work that people like always go back to reanimator? I mean, it's a great movie, kind of campy, yeah, but yeah, um, I think that's part of its charm. But like, okay, 30 something years later, when you were doing the score for this movie, did you think, oh my god, all these years later, I'm still going to be talking about it? Like, no, no, you know, it, it used to bother me a little bit, but then again, you know. This didn't become a cult classic overnight, right? It, it stood a long 30-odd year test of time to become what it's become. So you've had a love-hate with it. Well, <laughs> sure. You appreciate it now. Very much appreciate it now. No, at, at the time, I mean, I always thought it was a fun, quirky, you know, good film and all. But none of us, none of the hours to be director or producer. No one ever thought it was going to become what it is. Right? I think it was building more in the 90s. Like I remember being a teenager and going through someone's like old VHS, one of my friend's parents, and that's how we found it. And then we were like showing all our friends and I think maybe when DVD and all that, it started building. And I think the cult classic of it with the internet, I think now it's even bigger than like the 90s. It was kind of building like, oh, this old movie. It really didn't get paid attention to then. Right. Well, I paid attention pretty, pretty, pretty well, but not on the level. I was little baby, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah you might not read it. That was prior to downloads, you know? Like, you, you had to get on, like, might even slightly prior to cassettes, because. I think it was Beta Max first. <laughs> Beta lasted a minute or two. Right. You could actually rent the VCR from Blockbuster. That's right. That's right. Not even not even Blockbuster. Well, no, they're not around anymore. <laughs> but um, no, I understand your overall question. And, you know, yeah, one looks back on that, and you know, yes, that's got a lot of attention. But then a lot of other films I've done have yeah, as well. I mean. From Beyond also got a lot of attention. Puppet Master and Puppet Master mm -hmm. got a lot Those of attention. Those are very good films also. Resurrected got a lot of good attention. Uh, you know, so there's been a lot of films. Well, I just there. ask that because all your movies, everything you've scored, they put on here. One. You know, reanimator. So. But then again, for everybody else, they put one film on too, right? Yeah. So you have, you have know, everything that you've done, the thing that they would put, put on here. It's the most famous. Mm -hmm. It is. I can't deny that. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean I, I'd love to be known, you know, for some of the other scores, you know, but I am known for those, but this is no question, this is the most famous one. It's just the way it is. Better to uh, smile and enjoy it than cry about it. Not be like that guy with the pina colada song. Right. <laughs> I hate pina colada. I can't remember his name because I'm kind of bad with What is it? Names. They even joke about him on that, uh, like, uh, what hell is it? Yes, we're recording. <laughs> I was just checking the lights. Club Dread. Yes, Club Dread. Uh, and the dude's name is? I'm not that cool. Something Pete, right? What? What's the guy's name? What's the guy's name that does the Pina Colada song? Oh, oh, um, Steve Miller Band. Really? No, it's no, not Steve Miller. Miller. No, because they've actually had more than just one hit. Yeah, I can't remember who it is, but I don't think it's Steve Miller. It was not Steve Miller, but I we don't care about him. <laughs> I just know like he hates his cult status for that song and some people do, but I could see like in the beginning where it would be like some weird thing and not like it, but over time appreciate it, you know. You have to kind of appreciate the fan base to appreciate what happened, right? I mean, if I'm poo-pooing it, I'm sort of poo-pooing the, the, the fans who love it, in a way. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, on the other side on rock and roll, there's certain artists. They don't appreciate their fans, and then when their work dries up, no one finds their themes, they can't get hired, they don't understand, like, well, I alienated my fan base, and that's who's putting money in the pockets of the people paying me, so... That's exactly it. <laughs> when I go to other conventions, granted this is massive by comparison, but if I go to the Fear Hill or mm -hmm. you know, Fear Fest or whatever, right? The across the country. Uh, also, uh, Chicago, I'm going there. And it's There's like the Texas Frightmare Fest. Yeah, well, I'm into that one, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You go across the country in, in middle America and these places, you know, places that are not east and west coast. Yeah. There are a lot. Of <laughs> I mean, they really do. do you know, and they are like so appreciative to have somebody come and sign stuff or get CDs. Yeah, I have some friends in the horror industry and all they do all year between filming is go to conventions. I got a piece of that I can take it. If it wasn't for these people buying pictures signed or stuff at these conventions half the year, they wouldn't have their bills paid. Absolutely true. Mm -hmm. So there, so it's to get to uh, have an appreciation of the fan. It's not something to be poo at all. One should be happy enough and thankful enough that you've done something to create whatever fan base you have. I mean, come on, that's, that's pretty nice, right? For somebody to appreciate what you do or what you've done and want to meet you and thank you and all that. Hey, I wish I, every day was like that, right? Yeah. Well, um, Mojo has no questions. I think that's about it right now. We're supposed to keep it like five minutes. It was very good talking to you. My pleasure. Nice My meeting pleasure. you. Okay. You Hunter, as always, okay. you rock, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Watching, don't forget to like and subscribe or I will scratch your eyeballs out. This episode has been brought to you by Ziggret.com. There's nothing fake about it. We're the source for electronic cigarettes. Welcome to the 21st century. Quit smoking and start vaping. No tar, no secondhand smoke, no pollution, no offensive odors. Smoke without the guilt. We carry everything from egos to traditional electric cigarettes and a full line of accessories. So please come on down to Ziggret.com. All of our flavors are produced right here in the United States. And we can even say our flavors are kosher. So for the best flavors, the best vaping experience, that you can get, go to ziggret.com. And remember, all the flavor you will get vaping on your cigarette at ziggret.com. That's Z I G R E T.com.